Hi, my name is Alex Whitney and this is Conspiracy 101 and today we're going to be looking at North Korean abductions. So, specifically with this conspiracy we're going to be talking about North Korean abductions of Japanese citizens and we're going to be uh, discussing Korean, South Korean um, abductions by North Korea as well. But this is where the conspiracy element of it comes in. And each season, uh, this being season two, I talk about one conspiracy that became was actually true. A conspiracy theory that uh, turned out to be real life. Uh, in the first one, we talked about MK Ultra, And this one um, was considered by groups of Japanese people to be a conspiracy theory. Now, it's officially recognised, as you can see just there, by the Japanese government. But for a long time, these abductions were denied by North Korea and its symph sym <laughs> sympath sympathizers. Sympath sympath sympathizers, you know? The electronic musicians of North Korea. Including Shongrong, Shongryang, Shongryang, General Association of Korean Residents in Japan, and the Japanese Socialist Party, and were often considered by con uh, considered a conspiracy theory. Despite pressure from Japanese parents groups, the Japanese government took no action. So that's why we're talking about this. Um, in terms of an overall sense of Conspiracy 101, you know, this is true. This has actually happened. There is evidence of it in lots of different remits. And we'll be going through some of that evidence today. And, but, it, you know, considered in the past to be not true, a conspiracy theory. Uh, and it's very interesting that that conspiracy world will get thrown out a lot about things that later on could be true or in that moment might be true. Um, but it's a good way of discrediting things, isn't it? And we see that we see that a lot. A lot of things are easily discredited that are conspiracy theories, some not so much. Uh, but why why this? Why am I talking about this? There are lots of different other conspiracy theories that um, have turned out to be true and we'll cover them in future seasons. Well, as with the, uh, the phenomena that you get in movies and uh, written various pieces of media, um, sometimes lots of people talk about or produce the same thing at the same time. Um, it happens in Hollywood quite a lot. Uh, so the one I always think of is Deep Impact and um, Armageddon and Ants and Bugs Life come out at the same time about roughly the same thing. North Korea seems to be popular at the moment for some reason at least on the internet youtube world that i i occasionally live in uh there are two sh uh youtube shows that i watch which are really good much better than this one and i'll put their links in the description i've talked about in north korea relatively recently including abductions uh one was uh, atrocity guide atrocity uh, Atro atrocity guide and the other is paper will who's done more uh, less about abductions but more about north korean entertainment uh, both very interesting channels and if you are interested in this kind of conspiracy stuff you'll probably find their channels really fun i'll put the links in the description um and that's why it's in my head and because it's in my head i wanted to talk about it so let's talk about it so abductions of japanese citizens from japan by agents of north korean government took place during a period of six years from 1977 to 1983 did it is it is that the end or are they still doing it today that's where the modern conspiracy comes in are they still is this still a thing uh, although only 17 Japanese, eight men and nine women are officially recognised by the Japanese government as having been abducted, and we'll talk about those individuals later, there are many hundreds, there may be many hundreds of others. The North Korean government has officially admitted to abducting 13 Japanese citizens. There are testimonies that many non-Japanese citizens, including eight citizens from European countries and one from the Middle East, have been abducted by North Korea. Um... And there's a bit of an overlap as well, uh, which we'll, we'll more than likely get into, between what is an, an actual abduction and what is like a coerced abduction. Someone who is, uh, you know, afraid of their life um, and travels to Korea on, under false pretenses but isn't necessarily abducted, or maybe a prisoner of war, which then turns sides. Um, that happened, uh, you know, during the Korean War, a few Americans, famously. Um, went over to the Korean side and to the North Korean side uh, 
uh, and uh, and wanted to live there. But was that a reality? Uh, obviously, human rights in North Korea has a ridiculously long list, um, but human trafficking is an interesting one. So let's just briefly look at that. Uh, so it extends to men, women and children for the purposes of forced labour and or commercial sexual exploitation for the trafficker for the sort of country. You'll see this a lot with uh, some of the people we are going to be talking about where the Japanese were, they abducted Japanese ladies to become, or to become sort of concubines or, um, or wives of some of the American prisoners which um, changed sides. Uh, so, forced labour, North Korean workers sent abroad, which is a really interesting one. That's one I didn't really know about. Uh, so, number of North Korean migrant workers in Asia. So, as you can see, North Koreans are being sent around Asia and the Middle East. Um, so, the North Korean government recruits workers for bilateral contracts with foreign governments, including Russia, countries in Africa, etc., etc. There are credible reports that many North Korean workers sent abroad by the regime under these contracts are subjected to forced labour uh, with their movement and communications constantly under surveillance and restricted by North Korean government minders. So you can imagine where that would lead, wouldn't you? Where it's it's not really someone going over <laughs> across the pond to a different country to, um, you know, to work there of their free will, but really it's just a, a form of slave labour, isn't it? Um, since King Jong-un became leader in North Korea in 2011, the number of workers sent abroad has increased rapidly in order to obtain foreign currency and bypass international sanctions. That's a really interesting one. Um, so North Korea earned £1.6 billion, about $2.3 billion from a year from workers sent abroad worldwide. Uh, very, very odd behaviour from our country. So, background. In the 1970s, a number of Japanese citizens disappeared from coastal areas in Japan. So you have to remember that the, North, uh, the Korean War was the 50s. I think it ended, it hasn't technically ended, but it, it, they reached agreements in uh, the 1950s, I believe. In, I'm sure we'll get to the point where I'm, I'm wrong on that, but we you know. uh, In the 1970s, blah, blah, blah. Um, the people who had disappeared were average Japanese people who were opportunistically, opportunistically abducted by operatives lying in wait. Although North Korean agents were suspected, the opinion that North Korea had nothing to do with these disappearances was widely held. Most of the missing were in her 20s. The youngest, Megumi Yokota, uh, was 13. And she's a relatively famous case. Uh, when she disappeared in November 1977 from the Japanese west coast city of Niigata. Some of the victims were abducted to teach Japanese language and culture in North Korean spy schools. Older victims were also abducted for the purpose of attaining their identities. It is speculated that Japanese women were abducted to have them become wives to a group of North Korean-based Japanese terrorists belonging to the Yodo Go terrorist group after a 1970 Japan, Japan Airlines hijacking. Uh, and that some may have been abducted because they happened to witness activities of North Korean agents in Japan. Uh, which may explain Yokota's abduction at such a young age. There's lots of speculation about why she was abdu abducted. For a long time, yeah, we talked about that. It's a conspiracy theory. There are claims that the issue has been used by Japanese nationalists, including former Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihida uh, Suga and the late Shinzo Abe, to further militarise, push for revision of the constitution, to reduce constitutional limits on the army. So um, in a similar way to what, ha what, what happened to Germany after the Second World War, Japan was put into, um, purposely, obviously, by the Americans uh, to limit what they could do. The German example is probably best after World War, uh, Second, the First World War, where they really limited what they could do. Now, after the Second World War, they kind of realised that's a bad idea because sometimes that can backfire. Um, because if they don't have the ability to protect themselves, then they, uh, they may um, become more nationalistic. Uh, so, on September 17, 2007, then Prime Minister Munjiro Koizumi visited North Korea to meet North Korean leader Kim Jong-il for the first Japan-North Korea summit, which eventually resulted in the Japan-North Korean Pyongyang Declaration to facilitate normalisation of relationships between Japan. Kim admitted North Korea had abducted at least 13 Japanese citizens and issued an oral apology, which is very interesting. He was um, recorded talking about the abductions 
um, by a couple of uh, South Korean um, abductees, uh, who we will talk about when we talk about the North Korean abductions of South Koreans. Um, so it, it, it was there, it was a thing. It makes more sense, doesn't it, for them to be South Koreans rather than Japanese, but the fact they were... Yeah. So later North Korea allowed five of, uh, victims uh, said that it said were alive to return to Japan on the condition that they return later to North Korea. The victims whose identities were confirmed by DNA testing, dental records and fingerprint analysis were returned to Japan in 2002. Five repra repatriated victims were Yasushi Shimura and his wife Fuki, Kyura Hasuki and his wife Yuko, and Hitoma Soga, the wife of Charles Robert Jenkins, who remained in North Korea. So this is one of the ones who I was talking about. He was a United States Army deserter, a North Korean prisoner, and voice for Japanese abductees in North Korea. So he abandoned his patrol, walked across the Korean demilitarized zone in January 1965. Instead of being sent to the South Soviet Union and then traded back to the US, Jenkins was held in captive in North Korea for just over for over 39 years while held prisoner Jenkins was tortured forced to wed a captured Japanese national and formed in North Korean propaganda videos including films um, so we go to his acting uh, blah, 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 blah. this one Tenzan the ultimate mission Science fiction film directed by someone. That's not what I was thinking. Between, <laughs> international co-production between Italy and North Korea. What a strange mix. Anyway, um, further evidence of an investigations in November 2004, North Korea returned the cremated remains of two people, stating that they were those of Megumi Yukoto, Yukota and Kaori Masuki. The no who the North claimed died after being abducted. Subsequent Japanese DNA testing determined that those remains belonged to neither of the two. So it's still in that sort of conspiracy remit where they're sort of being a bit arthy, aren't they? However, the independent scientific journal Nature published an article highly critical of this testing, which was performed at Taikyo, Taikyo? University. Um, Without a professor being present. Ah, so it, it could have been, yeah. Further strained relations. Oh, that's so awkward, isn't it? Something so simple. So this is international. It, it, yeah. Very strange, very strange. So here's the list of victims. Um, I think in this article next. Oh, was it this one? No, this go okay, so this goes into the disappearance of Megumi Yokoto. So we're going to that in a second. There is, if I just pause that for a second, and then go on to here and uh, just type in North Korean. There is a really cool infographic um, showing all the different Japanese people. And there was one that was in English, which was nice. So let's have a look. We had to read that. Right, I'll show you what I'm looking at. Uh, so this is the one that's in Japanese. This is the one that's relatively famous. Aha, there's the English version, but there's also a um, an interesting one here. But it doesn't show the pictures, and I like the one with the pictures. So let's have a look at this. Uh, da, da, da. Let's just click on that. Ah, so it is from here. That's interesting. Right, so let's scroll down. That's obviously why I saved it. Well, this is really long. Right, open image and new tab, let's have a look. Okay, so what we got? Green is returned, red is yet to return. Um, officially recognized Japanese abductees. Uh, and then the age of, uh, of abduction at end of 2018. So when they were abducted and how old they would be at 2018. So add three years for now. So we've got Megumi Yokoto, probably one of the most famous, yet to return, although the DNA evidence might be a bit flawed, so we don't know. Uh, she was 13, she'd be 54 now. Uh, Nagata returned. You were 1978, 61, 62. Um, but you can see her all along the coast. 
Um, from an unidentified place. Oh, you can't see her in the corner. That's a shame. Uh, 22, she'd be 63 now. Again. You can see them all. Europe. 23-year-old from Europe. Looks like it's UK. Uh, Spain. Around 1980. Two men. Scary. Right, let's read about Megumi. So, Megumi Yokota was born... Uh, she became like the face, basically, of this. Was born on the 5th of October 1964 as the first child of Father Shigeru um, and Mother Saki. When Megumi was four, uh, she became big sister to her twin brothers, Takuya and Tetsuya. Shiguri, Shiguru worked for the Bank of Japan. In July 1906, he was transferred to Niigata Prefecture and the family of five settled in a town by the sea. Shiguru's hobby was photography and he took many pictures of his young family. Oh, this is, this is sad. In April 1977, Megumi started going to junior high school near her home. On the 5th of October 1977, Megumi became 13 years old. About 10 days later, in mid-October, the whole family went to Nagata Airport to see Shiguro's father off who had been visiting them. Megumi's photograph taken at the airport that day became the last one of hers taken in Japan. In the photograph, her hair was much shorter than before as she had ventured to a different hairstyle final photos is a scary topic um and maybe at some point we'll uh, talk about those not really a conspiracy but just spooky on the 14th of november 1977 megumi presented shiguru with a comb for his 45th birthday the next day on the 15th of november 1977 megumi did not come home from school after staying late to play badminton Having partnered with her friend at the street, at street corner, parted with her friend at the street corner, on her way home, she vanished. When her parents' frantic search failed to find her, they reported her disappearance to the police. Despite the police's best efforts, they found no clue, no witness, no signs of foul play, nothing. Megumi's devastated family had to live nearly two decades in the dark, not knowing what had happened to her. When overwhelmed by grief, Saki would shut herself in the cupboard to cry so that the twin boys would not see her. Shiguru cried too when he was alone having a bath. From the 1970s to the early 1980s, an unusual number of Japanese citizens had suddenly disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Journalist's, journalist Masami Abe noticed that three young couples had vanished within two months of July and August 1978. All of them were believed to have been by the sea at the time of disappearance. He subsequently published an article in Sankai Shimbun on the 17th of January 1980 under the headline, Three Couples Mysteriously Disappear. Foreign spy agency involved? The issue was raised at the Japanese parliament two months later for the first time, but was not taken too seriously and no action was followed. Several years later, Korean Air Flight 858 was bombed in November 1987. The two perpetrators turned out to be North Korean agents carrying fake Japanese passports. They both tried to kill themselves by ingesting cyanide and only one of them, 25-year-old female Kim hyung hu survived. She later confessed that she had been taught Japanese language and customs by one of the Japanese abductees in North Korea, with the investigation by the Japanese authorities helped by testimonies from North Korean defectors and former agents. It gradually became clear that North Korean, Korean governments, government was involved in the abductions of Japanese citizens. Eventually, Megumi was officially recognised by the Japanese government to be one of the victims of the North Korean abductions of Japanese citizens. It goes to the Wikipedia link. Japan, Japan's Association of Families of Victims Kidnapped by North Korea was formed in 1997 and Shiguru became of its first representative. He served the post for 10 years until he, his deteriorated deteriorating health forced him to step down so we've got a number of different things this story has been turned into lots of different media there was a major development in 2002 the japanese prime minister visited north korea on the 17th of september according to the former north korean diplomat tai yong ho kuzoyimu promised to give north korea 10 billion dollars in return for admitting to the abduction and returning the abducted that's an interesting twist isn't it that's not what was said in the wikipedia kim jong-il accepted the offer and verbally apologized stating that the abductions had been carried out without the knowledge of north korean government and those responsible had been disciplined although japan had officially recognized 
at least 17 Japanese citizens that had been abducted. North Korea insisted that the number abducted that had actually entered the country were 13, and that eight of them, including Megumi, had already deceased. Therefore, there are only five survivors. The cause of the eight deaths were explained as two in car accidents, two by gas poisoning, two of heart attacks, one of cirrhosis, and one by suicide. After negotiations, the five survivors were allowed to temporarily return to Japan and they placed their feet on the soil of their homeland the following month on the 15th of October. The five survivors understandably refused to return to North Korea, even though some of them had left their children behind. North Korea condemned this and rejected further negotiations. Wow. Because the abduction theory was too far-fetched to believe, until there was strong until then there was strong scepticism in the general public of Japan. North Korean leaders' assem- uh, admission blew it all away. The fury of Japan's public was tremendous. In May 2004, Ko- Koizumi visited North Korea for the second time, although Koizumi could no longer give North Korea 10 billion US dollars. The children of the returned abductees were successfully released to Japan in May and July of that year. At the time of Megumi's uh, disappearance, police used sniffer dogs, but the trail went cold about 800 yards from home. What happened to Megumi finally came to light when a former North Korean agent who had actually abducted Megumi made a statement. According to him, while Megumi's family were frantically searching for her, she was already confined in the cold and dark hold of a boat en route to North Korea. During the 40-hour journey, she desperately scratched the walls and the hatch opening, crying and calling for her parents. When she arrived in North Korea, her things were covered in blood, with one fingernail nearly lost. So this is where her school was. The area where Megumi's home was. From the testimony by Kim Hyung-hu, it is believed that another female Japanese abductee, Yaiku Dukuchi, was her teacher of Japanese language and customs. Kim Hyung-hu stated that Megumi Yokota was training another female agent. According to North Korea, Megumi married Kim Kim Yong-nam, a South Korean abductee, on the 15th of August 86 and gave birth to a baby girl in 1987. It was in September 2002, North Korea stated that Megumi was hospitalised on the 29th of January uh, 1993, suffering from depression. Two months later, after walking in the hospital grounds with a doctor's escort, Megumi managed to commit suicide by hanging herself from a pine tree. However, in November 2004, North Korea amended their statement that Megumi was in hospital in March 1994, and killed herself on the 13th of April that year. She was initially buried behind the hospital, but in 1996 or 1997, her husband exhumed her body for cremation and burial in a new location. Because of this, the location of the grave is now unclear. Her husband, Kim Yong nam later remarried it and now has a son with a second wife. Huh. In November 2004, North Korea has turned into like a, uh, like a mystery show, hasn't it? one of those true crime mysteries. In November 2004, North Korea returned a very small amount of Megumi's remains to Japan, together with a few photographs of her taken in North Korea. The DNA testing was carried out, included with controversy that the remains were not hers. Due to the lack of evidence of her death, many people in Japan would like to believe that Megumi is still alive. There has there have also been claims by North Korean defectors that saw some of the dead abductees, including Megumi, after their alleged deaths. In China, some believe that Megumi had been executed and cremated with others, and therefore North Korea had no choice but to hand over the remains of someone else. As Megumi's daughter, Kim in gyun her DNA matched with Megumi's, which confirmed their biological relations. So she did have a daughter. So that's good. That's, that's, she lived for a little bit, at least. Soon after the abduction, her as an older woman. Although North Korea had repeatedly offered Shiguri and Seiki Yokota a chance to meet their granddaughter, the Yokotas had refused, believing that Megumi should come first, and also fearing that a visit might be regarded as acceptance of Megumi's death. Fully aware of their age and deteriorating physical health, however, Saki and Shiguri met their granddaughter Kim in Gyeong in Mongolia, capital of Ulaanbaatar, in March 2014. Born in 1987, Kim met her husband at the University of Pyongyang. Although he taught her computer skills, they became close and married in 2011. Their daughter was born. Although, although he taught her computer skills, she still married him. Kim came with her family. Kim came with her family, her husband and her daughter, the Yokotas, great-granddaughter. 
After, uh, afraid of getting Kim in trouble, Yokotas did not talk much about Megumi. Uh, Kim just reiterated that her mother Megumi was dead. Shigura and Saki later stated that they spent three days together and Kim cooked them a meal. Saki loved seeing her granddaughter and great-granddaughter as she only had grandsons in Japan. She also realised later that it had probably been the last chance for them to travel abroad to see Kim, as Shigeru's health deteriorated soon afterwards. The Yokota's long wait for Megumi's return is now in its 41st year. For the first two decades, they had no idea what had happened to their daughter. They spent the next two decades tirelessly campaigning to get their beloved daughter back with tremendous decency and dignity. Very interesting. At the time of Megumi's abduction, they were in their 40s, but 40 years on, Mother Saki has become 82. Uh, this is all probably out of date. It has been reported that Suguri, Megumi's father, aged 85, lost his power of speech. The fact that Shinzo Abe is visiting them probably means it's way out of date. Um, what we're talking about. Is this going on to someone else? Ah, because Megumi was the youngest victim by far, she's become the symbol of the whole issue for over the years, to be honest. Uh, I guess this is from the guy who's writing it. Some more pictures and some interesting people afterwards. Your blog is interesting. I'm going to try and answer your questions regarding Megumi as best as I can. Uh, was she mistaken for an older person? Why was she abducted at 13? It's a really odd one, isn't it? Um... She was young, she might be mistaken for an old per older person. Maybe they wanted someone who was younger. Um, yeah. Spooky. Lots of information there that you can uh, go through on your own if you want to. Before I found out that they were abducting Japanese people, um, I found out that they were abducting South Korean people. Uh, so... An estimated 84,532 South Koreans were taken to North Korea during the Korean War. Let's just quickly click on the Korean War and just have a read about that. Korean War, also known by other names, was fought between North Korea and South Korea from 1950 to 53. It began in 1950 when North Korea invaded South Korea following clashes along the border and rebellions in South Korea. North Korea was supported by China and the Soviet Union, while South Korea was supported by the United Nations, mainly the U.S., uh, an armistice was 1953, so yeah, it was you know, it's still going on apparently. But it, you know, um, in addition, South Korean statistics claim that since Korean armistice agreement in 1953, about 3,800 people have been abducted by North Korea. The vast majority in the late 70s, 489 of whom were still being held in 2006. So that's really interesting that. You see the disparity, and I know it's a land border, so it would be easier to kidnap people and move them across from South Korea to North Korea, but there is a vast difference, isn't there, in the numbers. But the one that seems to be in the news and get uh, talked about a lot more is the Japanese abductees, apart from two people who we'll get to in a bit. So, South Korean abductees by North Koreans, North Korean are categorised into two groups, wartime abductees and post-war abductees. Koreans from the South who were kidnapped into the North against their wishes during the Korean War and died there or are still being detained in North Korea are called wartime abductees. Yeah, it's pretty obvious, and post-war is post-war. Okay, that makes sense. This is the diff that's the really complicated bit, isn't it? The defectors, the people who are wanted to move from one to the other. Um, and then... If they defect and then want to come back but are held against their will, are they an abductee? I guess so, but it's it's complicated, isn't it? During wartime, North Korea kidnapped South Koreans to increase its human capacity for rehabilitation after the war. It recruited, recruited intelligentsia, who were exhausted in North Korea and kidnapped those needed for post-war rehabilitation, technical specialists and labourers. So they seemingly were very picky about the people who they abducted and were very... Um, clever in the way they abducted people. Again, that will come back in a little bit. Okay, so in case of post-war abductees, Yoichi Shimada, a Fukyu... Fukyu... Fukyu? A Fukyu? 
university professor in Japan, states that North Korea appeared to abduct foreign citizens to 1. Eliminate witnesses who happened to run into North Korean agents in action. 2. Steal victims' identities and infiltrate agents back into the countries concerned. That's seemingly with some of the plots, uh, the terrorist plots. 3. Force abductees to teach their local language and customs to North Korean agents. 4. Brainwash them into secret agents. The fishermen hardly had access to valuable intelligence, but they could still be trained as spies and sent back to the South. 5. Use abductees' expertise or specialist skills. Um, the brain drain from North Korea and the Soviet Union um, was immense, and um, I think a lot of people were kidnapped because of that reason. The use of abductees as spouses for unusual residents in North Korea, especially lone foreigners such as defectors or other abductees. The six patterns are not mutually exclusive, especially numbers 2, 3 and 4 derived from Kim Jong-il's secret order of 1976 to use foreign nationals more systematically and thereby, thereby improve the quality of North Korean spy activities. Very interesting. Uh, okay, so North Korea's position about the abduction issue. Uh, North Korea's North Korea has shown different positions on the abduction issue. Regarding the alleged abduction of Japanese nationals on September 17, 2002, the North Korean government officially admitted to kidnapping... So this is the Japanese one, isn't it? As for South Korean abduction issue, North Korea has consistently claimed that there are no South Korean abductees in North Korea. I guess you could say that, you know, they're Korean, they're North Korean, <laughs> they're North Korean now... Um, so they refused to release South Korean wartime abductees, despite provisions allowing civilian abductees to return home uh, as part of the armistice. Uh, in regards to post-war abductees, North Korea insists that South Koreans defected to North Korea and remain there of their own free will, will which is a very, uh, very interesting one. So you've got the inter-Korean uh, talks held. Obviously, they're going to be discussing stuff. Um, uh, laws, wartime abductions, post-war. So this is the number of people. So you can see it slowly going up. 60s and 70s was definitely when it was more popular. And then it's come down. Uh, so major abduction cases. And hopefully it will come up with... Uh, are they not there? The two... Oh yeah, it's right there. <laughs> okay uh, in Feb so this is an abduction abroad but it is of South Koreans uh, in February 1978 South Korean actress Choi Yun Hee and her film director husband Shin Sang Ok were kidnapped in Hong Kong and taken to Pyongyang they were abducted on the orders of Kim Jong Il the son of North Korean President Kim Il Sung so this was before Kim Jong Il the famous the infamous Kim Jong Il was leader uh, who wanted the, to use them to improved the North Korean film industry. Shin attempted to escape and spent five years in a re-education camp before being reunited with his wife. While living in North Korea, Shin made the monster movie Pulgasari. Uh, in April 1984, South Korean government officials stated that the kidnappees were working in North Korean production, producing propaganda films that glorified Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. The couple escaped to the United States in 1986 while, filming, while on a filming assignment in Vienna. So this is a really interesting one. Again, it's detailed in um, Atrocity Guides video in which he detail, goes into it in a lot more uh, information. Um, but basically they were in Vienna trying to publicise, I think, uh, one, of their, one of their films or advertise it or just talk about it. And they managed to escape to the US embassy. Um, Paul Gassar is probably their most famous picture. It's basically a Godzilla ripoff. Um, but a very interesting one made by people who were kidnapped. Such a strange idea. Uh, and again, the history of North Korean entertainment is very weird because it's not very good. Uh, but that's what makes it interesting. Um, so let's move on and go to a, uh, the Asian Institute for P Policy Studies. Um, so this is just a short article from 2018, which I thought would be a nice way to end it and cap off some of the uh, figures and, and data that we've been going through. Kidnapping as foreign parliament... Policy. Foreign policy. Foreign policy. North Korea's history of state-sponsored ab abductions. Introduction. Since the end of the Korean War, there have been at least 143 incidents of abduction by North Korea involving 3,833 South Koreans. Of this number, 3,319 were released or successfully escaped back to the South. 
However, as of today, there are still 516 South Korean nationals held in the North. North Korea's policy of abducting citizens from the South is older than the country itself. On July 31st, 1946, Kim Il-sung stated, Not only do we need to search out all of Northern Cho Sung's intelligentsia in order to solve the issue of sorted of intelligentsia, we, but we also have to bring Southern Cho Sung's intelligentsia to the North. Beginning with the announcement, which sanctioned the abduction of South Korean intellectuals, three generations of Kim leaders have pursued a policy of kidnapping civilians from the South to further the goal goals of the regime. These abductions were not random acts initially by rogue operatives. They were authorised at the highest level. The ample use of different organs of the state, including army, naval and special forces, and the intelligence service indicated that abductions were systematically and fully supported by the regime. Originally envisioned by Kim Il-sung as a way to bolster the North's human capital stock, the regime soon realised that abductions served both strategic and propaganda purposes in its standoff with the South. The impunity with which the abductions were carried out, especially in the West Sea, Yellow Sea, emboldened the regime and put the South Korean military on the defensive. Hundreds of South Korean abductees, uh, an absolute majority of them impoverished fishermen, were also useful foil for the North Korean propaganda machine. When Kim Jong-il emerged as heir apparent to his father in the mid-70s, and extended his influence over the North Korean state, he took personal control of the power agencies within the state, and his preferences were soon reflected in a range of policy matters, including North Korea's abduction programs. With Kim's personal touch, the operatives from the North Korean regime, regime soon embarked on a risky strategy of abducting foreigners and South Koreans alike from well beyond the peninsula. But the North Korean abduction spree came to an end of with the end of the Cold War. With the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, North Korea was left politically and economically isolated, and as a result, the regime lost the ability to stage abduction operations in far-flung places. In more recent years, the regime has only been able to operate in the Chinese provinces that border North Korea. As the North Korean regime alerted its strategic goals amidst the changing international environment, their policy of abducting South Koreans and other foreign nationals evolved to fit their overall foreign policy goals. Over the years, the regime's kidnapping campaign went through three phases, the strategic phase, the covert expansion phase, and the defensive phase. While no specific event perfectly delineates these phases, each coincide with changes in the broader international environment. Strategic phase, 1955-77. to According to the South Korean government, of the 516 abductees still detained in the North, 487, 95%, were taken during the 22-year period from 1955 to 77. Compared to later years, the North Koreans' abduction methods during this time were exceptionally disruptive, brash and unambig unambiguous. Most of these abductions took place within South Korea itself or its territorial waters. Several occurred inside or close to the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. The abduction policy during this period was part of a wider plan to wreak havoc in South Korea and prepare for a renewed attempt to reunify the peninsula by force. It was also a strategy by which Kim Il-sung hoped to secure the legitimacy of his regime while simultaneously delegitimizing the government in Seoul. To understand the importance of abductions in the strategic phase, one must look at the wider state of affairs of the peninsula at the time. The years following the Korean War were difficult throughout the peninsula, with both Korean, Korea struggling to rebuild the infrastructure and recover the human capital lost during the war. As Kim Il-sung realised in 19, uh, 1946, the South possessed a greater number of intellectuals, an asset the North sorely needed if they were to revitalise the struggling economy. To attract them, the North Korean leadership either needed to persuade these intellectuals to defect or bring them to the DPRK by force. But early in his reign, Kim's widespread purges of enemies of the state quickly extinguished any hope of coaxing the servant intellectuals to defect. Even the North Korean elite were abandoned in the regime. Increasingly fearful of the punishments that befell those who lost favour with... Uh, let me just get rid of these. There we go. Favour several uh, prominent North Korean officers posted overseas and a dozen North Korean exchange students studying in the USSR defected. The regime made several attempts to kidnap these non-returnees and was successful in abducting at least one postgraduate student at the Moscow School of Music who had applied for asylum. The student, Yi Sang-un, was reportedly seized in broad daylight and sent back to Pyongyang. That sucks. 
in addition to reigning in their own defectors, North Korea soon used abductions as a means to achieve another goal of the regime, recruiting spies. North Korea needed spies to disrupt South Korea, foment dissension, and prepare for what they assumed would be inevitable resumption of the war. As the South uh, struggled econom economically, remaining heavily dependent on US assistance, Kim Il-sung continued to believe that the South Korean people would rise up against the government in North Korea if North Korea could provide, prove itself to be the superior system. South Koreans kidnapped during this time were indoctrinated with pro-North propaganda, but ultimately on t only two were sent back to South Korea as spies, only to be promptly caught by the authorities. The phase reached its apex during 1966 and 69, a period sometimes referred to as the Second Korean War, for its low-level guerrilla warfare-style skirmishes along the border. In January 1968, North Korea captured the USS Pueblo, a US Navy intelligence ship in international waters, and held its crew captive for 11 months. That same year saw the audacious Blue House raid and a number of other infiltration attempts into the South. During these tense years, North Korea kidnapped South Korean civilians at an unprecedented rate. Of the 516 South Korean abductees in the North today, 133 were taken in 1968 alone. These abductions, skirmishes and raids sought to draw South Korean and US resources away from the Vietnam War while sowing as much confusion as possible and testing the resolve of ROK-US alliance. On December 11, 1969, North Korea executed its most audacious abduction scheme. A North Korean agent hijacked a Korean Airlines flight and forced the pilots to land in Pyongyang. After 66 days, 39 of the 46 passengers were allowed to return to South Korea, but the four crew and seven remaining passengers were not allowed to leave. They were kept in North Korea because they had skills that could be used, be of use to the regime. Their families and friends never saw them again. To illustrate how North Korea justified their actions to the world, it is helpful to look at a specific case of how their diplomats spun the events. On February 15th, 1974, two South Korean fishing vessels, the Suwon Ho 32 and the Suwon Ho 33, were attacked by North Korean Navy. The former boat was sunk while attempting to escape and the latter was captured. Later that month, the UN Military Armistice Commission held a meeting with the North Koreans to discuss the issue. The two sides retelling of the incident is revealing. The UN. At uh, 10.03 hours, Suwon Ho 3 radioed, Ashore, and its location was indicated by the picture clearly in international waters some 30 nautical miles from North Korea. It also reported that one of your side's gunboats and opened fire from a distance of approximately one mile. As a result, this unprovoked attack, the Swan Ho 32 was sunk. Following this, your gunboat forced the incident, innocent unarmed Swan Ho 33 to accompany it towards North Korea. DPRK, the spy boats of your side disguising themselves as fishing boats, Doggedly refused to comply with the repeated demand for our People's Army naval vessel on routine patrol duty in the Western Sea for the withdrawal from our coastal waters. Upon the disclosure of their true colours, your side spy boat, Swan 32, hurriedly veered to the southwestward to flee and rammed her stem. Is that stern? No, it's stem. Uh, against our naval craft which was just turning sideways and another spy boat, Swan 33, was captured by our side on scene of the incident. In February 2014, 40 years after, she, after he was kidnapped, Cho Young Chul, one of the crewmen of the Swan Ho 33, was allowed to briefly reunite with his relatives during one of the rare gatherings of separated families organised by North and South Korean governments. For most families of abducted fishermen, however, the fate of their loved ones remains unknown. Total abduction episodes by location. So, yeah, in the sea seems to happen a lot, but on land as well. Very interesting. And in different places. Covert expansion phase, 77 to 90s. Beginning in the mid-1970s, the nature of North Korean abductions by South Koreans changed significantly. The mass abduction of South Korean fishermen virtually ceased by 1975, but it was followed by the first abductions of Japanese citizens in 1977. While the overall number of abductions declined, the geographic scope of the abductions expanded as the regime's agents went beyond the peninsula to abduct their victims. South Korean citizens from as far away as Europe and North Africa were now targeted, and the regime began to systematically abduct non-Koreans, especially young Japanese. This change in North Korea's abduction strategy coincided with the changes in the international environment at the time, 
and the internal power dynamics within the regime. First, North Korea could no longer maintain an aggressive stance against South Korea and the United States. The US USSR detente, 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 was well underway by the early 1970s, and the growing Sino-Soviet schism prompted the two communist behemoths, behemoths to explore better relations with the US separately. With its two patrons shying away from direct confrontation with the US, North Korea could no longer sustain its aggressive strategy targeting the South. As a result, the situation in the peninsula became relatively stable, which led to the first attempt at an inter-Korean dialogue since the end of the Korean War. Along with the improvement of, in inter-Korean relationships, South Korea improved its defensive in the West Sea. In the mid-70s, South Korea deployed French-made exocet anti-ship missiles in the West Sea, creating a significant deterrent, uh, deterrence effect against North Korean incursions. In addition, more patrol ships were deployed to protect the vision vessels, lowering the chance of successfully hijacking, hi, successful hijackings by North Korea. Internally, the rise of an ambitious young leader within the regime meant a change in the direction of North, Koreans, North Korea's overall abduction policy. Perhaps reflected of his own preference for maintaining a low public profile, Kim Jong-il changed the nature of North Korea's abduction strategy from overt to covert. And Kim also took a personal interest in the abduction targets. He was directly responsible for the most famous abduction case, that of South Korean actress Cho Young hee and her husband, director Shin sang Ok. Ok? 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 sang Ok. In 1978, the two were used by the regime to reduce propaganda films until they escaped in 1986. Kim played a major role in the abductions of South Koreans and other foreigners via his web of agents. According to the report by the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, published in 2014, the overseas kidnappings were carried out by Office 35 of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea, uh, an intelligence bureau controlled by Kim Jong-il. The stakes were high for the North Korean agents tasked with abductions of South Koreans. The former deputy director of the North Korean spy agency allegedly claimed that agents who failed to abduct their target could face execution. Abductions or abduction attempts of South Koreans by North Korean agents were made in Iraq, West Germany, Norway, Paris, Hong Kong, Karachi, Beirut and various other locations in Japan, Yugoslavia, Austria, Libya and Egypt. Most of these victims were students or skilled professionals. They were chosen for their knowledge and expertise, which the regime exploited. North Korea perpetrated abductions in these far-flung locales in order to limit the risks of infiltrating South Korea directly. Kidnapping in a third country also allowed the regime to pause plausibly deny any involvement if their agents were compromised. In contrast to the strategic phase, the regime was emphatic in avoiding exposure rather than fermenting havoc. However, this did not mean that South Koreans were secure in their own country. Five South Korean high school students were abducted from beaches in South in the summers of 77 and 78. Only one has seen his family during a brief reunion in 2006. Well, also during this time, North Korea abducted at least 17 Japanese civilians from Japan between 77 and 93 with the bulk of the abductions taking place in 77 to 90, to 80, sorry. Uh, we've talked about the Japanese. Uh, in the late 1970s, North Korea also kidnapped an unknown number of foreign women from Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia. The fates of many of these women are unknown. Defensive phase, 1990s to today. With the collapse of the North Korean economy in the 1990s, the regime's ability to conduct complicated missions abroad was severely curtailed. It also became increasingly difficult to abduct citizens from South Korea and Japanese coasts. As both countries modernised their maritime defences, packaging abductions as defections for propaganda purposes also lost its meaning as North Korea, Korea's economic situation became increasingly desperate and even the North Korean public stopped believing the regime's propaganda. The current period can be described as a defensive phase, for North Korea's kidnapping strategy over the past 20 years has forced on individuals who posed a direct threat to the regime's stability. For this end, North Korea has targeted North Korean defectors and South Korean religious and human rights activists working in the Chinese North Korean border region, specifically those helping North Koreans defect to South Korea. Abducting and bringing the victims <coughs> to North Korea across a 
porous border is not a logistical challenge for the agents, the cost of abduction operations is thus relatively low, and as a result, abduction plays a valuable role in the state security policy. Those captured and brought to North Korea likely face harsh retribution by the regime. Such was the case of Jing Jong Suk, a North Korean defector of South Korean citizenship who returned to China North Korean border in August 2004. According to her family, Mrs. Jim was on her honeymoon and returned to the North Korean border to try and smuggle in some presents for her relatives. At some point, a group of North Korean men forcefully, forcefully seized her and dragged her into North Korea. However, a month after the incident, the South Korean National Intelligence Agency disputed these events. They claimed that Mrs. Jin had actually been at the border in order to film North Korean opium farming and that her abduction was unconfirmed. Despite the family's protests, she was never added to the official government list of abductees. The following January, Mrs. Jin's mother, who had also defected to the South, received news from an acquaintance in North Korea that her daughter was dead. Another well-known abduction case is that of Kim Dong-sik, a South Korean pastor captured in China in 2000 after two years of work in the border regions helping defectors escape to South Korea. He was approached by a female North Korean agent claiming to be a defector. After gaining his trust over the span of several months, she lured him to a restaurant where he was taken by other agents across the border. He was reported to have died the following year after months of mistreatment and torture. And... If a victim can't be taken, even more brutal methods can be applied. A Korean pastor, Hang Chung Yol, was found murdered near Chinese North Korean border in April 2016, having faced threats from North Korean agents for years as he worked in the region. Chinese police investigated allegations that he was murdered by two North Korean agents who have since slipped back across the border, but the case remains unsolved. According to the South Korean government, only three of the three of the 516 abducted citizens left in North Korea captivity were taken since 1995. So, only three. It's um, becoming less, less... It's not happening as much. Although the actual number is most certainly much higher. The UN has listed more than a dozen cases of Chinese and South Korean citizens kidnapped by North Korean State Security Department from the late 1990s to the early 2000s. In May 2016, the South Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs held a meeting with representatives uh, from 10 major travel agencies in South Korea. They had been summoned for a briefing on the threat posed by North Korean agents abducting South Korean citizens in northern China. The meeting was prompted by a series of threats from the northern Korea, North, North Korean regime to kidnap South Korean citizens abroad as retaliation for a mass defection of workers from a North Korea-owned restaurant in China the previous month. One source claimed as many as 300 North Korean agents had been dispatched to the border regions in China to track and abduct unwitting South Korean tourists and activ activists. These agents will sometimes work a single case for months or even years in order to gain the trust of the victims before the abduction takes place. North Korean regime uses use of abduction for propaganda and ensuring internal uh, external security has continued under Kim Jong-un. Recently, there has been an increasing number of North Korean defectors voluntarily returning to the North. South Korea's Ministry of Unification reported that as of 2016, there were 19 confirmed cases of defectors voluntarily returning to North Korea. Although some may indeed have returned on their own, there is increasing concern that some may have been forced to return against their will likely because of the regime's threats against their family members remaining in the country. The fact that returning defectors are often shown on state TV denouncing South Korea while praising the regime increases the likelihood that the North Korean authorities are orchestrating the, voluntarily, the voluntary return of defectors for propaganda purposes. Conclusion South Korea has a few, via, has few via, viable options to ascertain the whereabouts of their abducted citizens, let alone repatriate them. North Korea either insists that the abductees have defected to the North voluntarily, or refuses to acknowledge that they were taken in the first place. And the tendency by the South Korean government to downplay the abductee issue to focus on the larger goals of denuclearization and unification only exacerbates the problem of collected amnesia about the abductees. While the world is looking the other way, North Korea has continued to use abductions as a foreign policy tool. In fact, it may be entering a fourth phase in which the regime unlawfully detains foreigners who enter North Korea voluntarily. Today, North Korea holds three foreign citizens in detention for what it claims are crimes against the state. These are Korean-American Kim Jong-chul, 
Kim Sang Duk and Kim Hang Song. One, a Korean Canadian pastor, Lim Hyung Su, was released in 2017 after being de- detained since 2015. American detainees uh, like these have been used as bargaining chips by the regime to leverage high meetings from high level meetings from American leaders as when former President Bill Clinton visited Pyongyang in 2009 to free American journalists Laura Leng and Eno Lee. But the North Korean regime may have overplayed its hand. An American college student, Otto Wombia, who had also entered the country voluntarily but was detained by the North Korean authorities for arbitrary reasons in 2016, died soon after being released to his family in June 2017, having apparently suffered a catastrophic brain damage during the early stage of his detention. While his death galvanised the American public's opinion uh, and put a spotlight back on the issue of abductees, his case is baffling, as releasing him in the comatose state would have further furthered no conceivable strategic aim of a regime and was thus an outlier in these detainee cases. In order to prevent the North Korean regime from engaging in further use of abductions as a policy tool, policymakers and the media should increase public awareness of this issue. The South Korean government and the international community in particular should take the following steps to prevent further abductions from happening in the future. A bunch of different points. Hang on. Is this whole video a conspiracy to make people believe? T- it's just one big conspiracy after another. Right, that was a really long article and a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, but I felt like it was worth reading. And I did. So, like I said before, we're not going to do a um, Wikipedia article of the week. Season two, we're doing picture of the week. And um, not all of these pictures are going to be very nice. Um, And this one isn't. And I felt because of this is a, a serious episode, we should have a serious picture uh, for this one. Um, and what there is, there's something called the World Press Photo. And it's just one of the best photos taken for press reasons. And for whatever reason, I, I, I chose, chose this one. Um, it's quite a striking photo. It's not very nice. Um, and it is of uh, a poor lady. Um, so let's just read a little bit about it. So 16th of November, 1985. So this was 1985 or 1986's winner. Uh, Amare Sanchez, 12, is trapped in the debris of the Nevado del Lures volcanic eruption while rescue re- rescue workers who could not reach her were waiting for materials to arrive. She eventually lost consciousness and died of a heart attack. On the 13th of November, 1985, the Nevado del Ruiz, a 5,000 metre high volcano in the Los Nevados National Park, erupted. The explosion produced several flows of mud and debris, which raced down the slopes of the volcano and through the river valleys. The town of Amario was swallowed, killing 25,000 people. Um, she was caught in it. Uh, she was trapped, and they couldn't get her out. And much of her lower half was trapped really badly. So even if they had got her out, she was probably still going to pass. But she was conscious and awake for a very long time. I believe there is video of her talking. Um, but I always, I always come back to this photo. It's very striking. It's scary and ethereal. Uh, and definitely worth talking about. So that her memory is not lost. This has been a very serious episode. Most, is this, if this is the first Conspiracy 101 we've watched, this is, n- this is not what they're like. Um, but occasionally we need to take things seriously. Some conspiracies are true. Um, some conspiracies that are now considered conspiracy theories are true. And sometimes things happen that aren't very nice, but we should still talk about them, discuss them, and... Uh, and still show them uh, and i think that brings an end to this episode thank you very much for watching and i'll see you again next time